Thanks for joining us. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is We've Got Issues. We've Got Issues is a nonpartisan citizens-based forum where we talk about issues of interest to the Tri-Cities. And we'd like to thank Tri-Cities Community Television for making these interviews possible. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that our interview today is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of Coquitlam First Nation. And we thank the Coquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and to protect the lands and the waters and all that lies above and below. So this afternoon, we're joined by Phil Bucken, who is taking a run for Coquitlam City Council. So thanks so much for joining us today, Phil. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to talk about my campaign and my platform, things like that. Sounds wonderful. We're really interested and looking forward to hearing more. I was wondering if you could maybe um, just start by sharing a little bit about yourself, who you are, what your background is, for people who may not be familiar. Oh, okay, yeah. So my name is Phil Buchan, and I was born in Calgary, but I lived all over Canada because my father was in the army. So I lived in Kingston, Ontario. I lived in Chilliwack for That's six years. That's an army in the, base. In the in yeah. the 70s, then I lived in Germany for five years, from 76 to 81. Then I came back to Calgary and I went to the University of Calgary and I studied political science. So I think I'm suited to be a counselor because that's what I studied at school, and. Also, I've lived in Japan for 18 years. I was teaching English in Japan. I taught at companies and I taught at some junior high schools and high schools. And then I returned to Canada in 2013. Three of the reasons that, well, I'll give two of the reasons. Third reason is kind of too political. But two of the reasons I came back was, actually th three reasons. My, I was turning 50. So I wanted to have my 50th birthday party in Canada. And my father was getting married, his second oh, marriage. Oh, wow. Lots of celebrations. Yeah. And the, I experienced the earthquake in Japan in 2011 in Tokyo. So oh. it really, really scared me. Wow. So, so that's one of the reasons that we left Japan, because we didn't want to experience a major earthquake again. That would be pretty scary. Yeah, 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 that's quite the experience. So it sounds like you've um, had a lot of travels around the world, seen a lot of the world, and you also have an educational background. Um, you said you took political science in at the University of Calgary. So um, what what um, sort of information from that, or how will that help you as city council, on city council? Well, actually, my, one of my projects when I was a university student was I, I worked on a female who was running for city council in Calgary, and I wrote a an essay about it, about my experience. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. she, she lost the election, but it was great to see about everything that she was doing, like door knocking and making signs and making pamphlets and talking to voters and working on her platform and things like that. So it was really informative for me. And now I'm doing the same thing myself. Right. So all those experiences came in really handy, right? Because like you say, the door knocking, the campaigning, the brochures and all the things that you need to know for your own campaign, you um, got to experience there and maybe learn from them, things that you might do a little bit differently. And um, so all good experience. Yeah, so um, can you, Tell us a little bit, I see you in the community, like I see you out at um, tree walks, I see you at, I saw you at a reconciliation event last weekend. Um, how else are you engaged in the community? Um, well, I'm a member of the Legion, and I've been a member for about eight years, and every year I sell poppies outside uh, supermarkets or liquor stores or yeah. place other places to raise money for the, for the veterans. Excellent. Can you tell us what inspired you to be um, run for city council in Coquitlam? Um, I think there's two things. Um, I went to the, the public meeting about the two towers beside the Safeway 
on oh, Austin okay. in 2018. Right. And I made a speech about why is there no affordable housing in these two towers. They did build, they are, it's built, being built now. They did build 12 accessible apartments right. for disabled people. But all the other apartments are market rentals right. for buying and there's no, oh, sorry, market, um, market housing. For not, sale. Not rentals, for yeah, sale. for sale, for sale. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the accessible units, um, are those subsidized in any way or? Are they yeah, they are. Okay. They are, they are subsidized. I totally agree with that, but what about for other low-income people? Right. Why was there nothing else in right. these buildings? And it seems like there were a few people that spoke about having more affordable housing in those two towers, but it seems like the city just ignored us and voted for, voted to not change anything. Right. Okay. Well, that sounds like it was good inspiration. Um, and you said there was something else. There's oh, yeah. That the other thing you? is um, about the by-election. Um, Councillor Benita Zerolo, she she resigned on October first last year. Right. And she resigned to take on another position. Yeah. She resigned right? to become an yeah. MP. And the city was legally required to have a by-election, but they didn't. And I just think that why did they take away all the democratic voting rights of all Coquitlam residents? It, it just it so disappoints me. When that position was left vacant, so the constituents that voted for Benita Zerillo, are you saying that they now they their voice is not being heard because they voted for her, she was representing them, and now she's in a different position, but there's nobody to replace her. So no, we don't have an opportunity to put somebody else into that position, is that? Well, I'm saying that all Coquitlam citizens didn't get a right to vote right. to replace her. Not just right. not just her constituents, but oh, all okay. Coquitlam citizens, right? Okay, yeah. um, and then is that what you mean by participatory democracy? Can you tell us what that term means? Yeah, it just means that the, the mayor and the councillors, they will, they will respond to citizens' concerns and not just try to run the city without um, consulting us or asking us for our feedback or things like that. Okay, so it's bigger than the by-election. It, yeah, it's yeah. like an overarching sort of principle that we should yeah. be running the city by. Yeah. Um, I just want to go back a little bit on the by-election. Okay. So why was there not a by-election? Okay, the city said there was um, COVID. COVID was really bad at that time. Okay. Between October and December, that was the 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 window was only October to December to have a buy because after January first, the city is not required. To oh, have, okay. To, required to have a by election, and I just I just think because there was five other municipalities that had by elections. Right. Lytton, which we all know, oh, was, was burned down. The dealing whole town with a down, lot but they of still have a by election. Right. Nanaimo Regional Council had one. Silverton had one. Wells had one. Wells. They all had mm -hmm. they all had by elections during COVID the same time that Coquitlam did not. So that was the reason that was given was because it was due to COVID that But that was one of the reasons. I can't remember the other Okay. The other reasons. So are there consequences for not having a by election? Um and one more thing I forgot, the, the provincial government sent three emails to the mayor and the city councillors, you must hold this by-election according to law, and they ignored all the emails. Um, there was also a, a court case <laughs> brought by two citizens of Coquitlam that right. sued the mayor and the councillors. But unfortunately, it wasn't brought to court until June, so it was too late. To have oh, okay. election. The decision was kind of neutral, I guess. I don't know. It wasn't, mm -hmm. they didn't criticize the city, but they didn't say that they were, they should have done it, or it was kind of like a neutral. 
I wonder if sometimes there's a hesitation for um, provincial, the provincial level of government to, um, I don't want to say interfere, but to um, rule over municipal uh, um, level. Like it seems like they want to kind of stay separate. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I think so, because maybe they didn't want to cause any friction between the provincial yeah, government I'm and not, the city of Coquitlam. Yeah. Not sure what the reason is, but there <laughs> seems to be that hesitancy for some reason. Yeah. So for participatory democracy, other than the by-election and the by-election not happening when it should have, are, do we have issues with with participatory democracy or do you think we have a, um, a good engagement and, and good public awareness and consultation? Um, I would say yes and no. Um, another thing that I was, the, the Blue Mountain Park, they're going to be um, renovating Blue Mountain Park and there's, there's a waiting pool. It's right. the only waiting pool left in Coquitlam and they're going to take it away. They've decided it already. There were some people that were against this idea, and I think they they gave some feedback to the city. But the final the final plan hmm. means that the waiting pool will be. Why are they gone. taking the waiting pool? It would seem like during the summer, you know, when it's hot and. I think if one it's of the things there. is they're they're just saying it's too old. There, it's been there for a long time, and maybe they can't they can't renovate it and modernize oh, okay. it. So that's why they're they're getting rid of it. But I want to save the waiting pool because it's free recreation for families, mm -hmm. right? Every time I'm there in the summer, it's very busy with families enjoying free recreation, it's something they don't have to pay for, right? For, for all families, you have people coming to Blue Mountain Park. I was door knocking there the other day. There's people there from Burnaby, Mission, Langley, mm -hmm. Surrey. Even though it's a really small park, you get it visitors from all over Vancouver I had area. never been to Blue Mountain Park until a couple of weeks ago, and I, I think I actually saw you there. Yeah. And it's a beautiful park it's with amazing, some yeah. really nice, mature trees there. And you know, it's in a it's a lovely space. So hopefully, something can be worked out. I don't know, um, you know, if people can maybe speak up and go to council with it. And I yeah, I think we've already spoke up, and I think we lost, but. I'll mm -hmm. try it if I can get elected and see what I can have, see what I can do. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll have the the waiting pool at Blue Mountain Park is not over yet. <laughs> well, that's that's good to know. Um, one thing that I think you've spoken about before and that's of interest throughout the Tri Cities, of course, is housing and affordable housing. We're seeing a an affordability crisis with respect to housing. Um, are we meeting the housing needs of people? Um, yes and no. So there's, there's two sides. We okay. are building some affordable housing, but we're not doing enough. Okay. There are some buildings where there's only 5% below market housing in the buildings or below market rentals. Right. I want to see a minimum of 20% in all new developments. Because we're, we're in a housing crisis. Right. I, I hear people all the time, when I've been door knocking recently, they're saying, yeah, housing affordability. We need housing for everyone. Even the, the homeless shelter in Gordon. Mm -hmm. There are only 30 spots in that right. housing shelter, in that um, homeless shelter. And unhoused people are... They're humans too, right? They need a place to live. Yes, it's it's difficult. It's a difficult conversation for sure. Um, and I know we do have a homeless population that are out there and they're vulnerable. And you know, as a society, that's our role, right? To make sure that every nobody falls through those cracks. Um, so, are there other kinds of housing that we need as well? Yeah, we need. We need to work with the provincial government and the federal government and nonprofits and developers to 
provide right. safe, affordable, and appropriate housing for everyone, regardless of their their income or regardless of their situation. Right, and you're saying that you feel that 20% for all new developments would would help to meet that need? I think it should be higher. I think it should be 30%, okay, so you're but hoping. I'll start at 20%. Yeah. But, <laughs> but you're willing... 20% is like a base okay, for me. For that, me. Yeah. Where, that's where we start yeah, from. Yeah. Um, so can we ask developers to do that? Are we asking developers to do that? Or, you know, should we be pushing harder on them? Yeah, we have to push harder on them. They're making a lot of money building all these towers and the new Fraser Mills that's, that's been approved already. Mm -hmm. We have to push them harder to get more affordable housing in Coquitlam because it's, it's a housing emergency. Yeah, there's a lot of development going on and it's always kind of, I don't, I have a hard time wrapping my head around it. We have so much development going on and yet we've got a housing crisis. So it's like, how do you get that balance between building new units and having people being able to access them, right? Um, it's, it, yeah, it's gonna, it's a huge challenge. And it's not just Coquitlam, of course, it's everywhere, but Coquitlam seems to be growing at such a fast pace right now. Do you think um, development is there too much or not enough, or do we, we, do we have a choice? Um. Well, I think on Burke Mountain, I think there's, I think there's enough, yeah, because we have to protect those wildlife habitats on mm -hmm. Burke Mountain, right? And from what I'm hearing from people, that's why the bears and the coyotes are, and the cougars are coming yeah. down into Coquitlam, right? And it's going to make for a very dangerous situation, right? the interaction between wildlife and people, right? It's going to be really scary. And I think we need to protect those trees and that wildlife habitat on Burke Mountain. Yeah, I live at the base of Burke Mountain. And I can tell you, we have a lot of bears in our neighborhood. And, um, you know, and as you say, even cougars and coyotes and stuff are, we've pushed them so far up the mountain that they can't really go up much higher and, and survive. So um, that's another question that's it's a really difficult one to grapple with, like development versus retaining our, our natural spaces. Um, so I just want to maybe talk a little bit about natural spaces and specifically trees. Um, do you think trees are important in the city? Like, should we be protecting our, our big trees? Of course they are. Um... I actually watched your Brook Mountain Naturalist speech to on on YouTube and the tree canopy about the urban forest management. Yeah. We need to build more trees or sorry, we need to plant more trees, but we also need to protect the trees that we have mm -hmm. because they cool down our cities and they also take away, store, they store carbon dioxide it's in the true. trees. It's super important yeah, during... Yeah, yeah. And they're good for business. Mm -hmm. This is all taken from your, oh. your speech. <laughs> I'm and glad you... I'm because glad you. if a business has a tree canopy, then mm -hmm. more people are going to go there because it's more comfortable and it's cooler to go into the store and buy, buy something. So something that I think we don't always realize that trees are actually good for business, right? We think, you know, we cut down the trees so we can build the businesses, but really both are, are important. Um, so it's a matter of how do we find that balance? How do we keep those big trees? And, and still, you know, we know that development is going to happen, but how can we respect our natural spaces as well? Yeah. And also the, the river view lands, I'm sorry, I can't remember the, yeah, the First Simic Nations Wilder. pronunciation of the... Yes. Yeah. Um, we really, really have to protect all those trees there because there is such a wide variety of trees. Yeah, I've been on three or four tree walks in the River Rue area, and it's just amazing that the information we get from 
from the people that do the tree walks and it just it blows me away that um, we have such an amazing space in Coquitlam that we have to protect forever for the next generations. It is, as you said, an am amazing space and those trees are magnificent there. So um, yeah, it's been a long, long sort of battle to make sure that those trees stay up. Um, I guess one more area that um, might be of interest is transportation and transit and traffic. Like, how do we sort of manage traffic? We've got development, you know, we're trying to keep green spaces, but we still need infrastructure. Um, people are still in their cars. How do we reduce traffic through the city? Like, what can we do? Well, the most important thing is that we have to um, expand our transportation system, the bus system, the sky train, to make it easier for people to get rid of their cars and go all in on transit. Yeah. And also, I think even this is kind of being brought up in other parts of Canada, is making transit free for everyone. Even now in right. BC, it's free for children under 12, but why don't we make it free for everyone and then we can reduce global emissions and it's it's a win-win for the planet and for for people they don't have the stress of being mm -hmm. in traffic and things like that they can sit on the bus and sit on the sky train and read and do work on the train but in your car well you can listen to podcasts on the radio or stuff like that but you can't really work when you're when you're in the car and we also have to um, get more jobs in Coquitlam mm -hmm. because people, most people are leaving Coquitlam every morning to go to work because there is a lack of jobs in Coquitlam. If people can work in Coquitlam, then they can, they can take their bicycle to work right. or they can walk to work or they can take transit to work. And it improves people's lives because they're not stuck in traffic. Like I work in Delta. I have to drive 45 minutes to go there and 45 minutes to right. come back every day. That's 90 minutes of my life. That's a lot of time every, every, day, day. every day. Yes. Yeah. And the carbon emissions and everything else, the expense. So there's a lot of reasons to try and make it so that people can live and work within their own community or take some of those transit options, right? So I'm gonna talk about something and we'll try and touch on it. Um, it's about, you've made a stand and you've been quite vocal about um, anti-racism. So with the um, sort of some of the recent um, hate that's come out during COVID, um, you know, we've seen an increased level of, of racism. And we've also, um, you've made a statement about your commitment to truth and reconciliation. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Oh, okay, we'll start with the, the anti-racism stuff. The, the, um, it also actually, well, I've been doing it for a long time, but the, the big thing was when the mosque attack happened in New Zealand. Right. And I was so shocked, shocked by it. And then I went to the mosque in Burnaby after it happened and talked to people. Yeah, it's, it's... And it was, it was hard, but actually I got interviewed by John Hernandez from the CBC. Oh, wow. Uh, at that yes. time, so. It's a tough conversation yeah. for sure. Um, but all the people were really welcoming at the mosque, and yes. it was really well for him. I, yeah, it's it's a hard thing. And then the the other one, like you were talking about during COVID, is mm -hmm. the anti-Asian racism. Yeah, I think that yeah. caught some of us off guard. Like I know there, I I know there's racism. We're surrounded by it, but it really, I have to say, it caught me off guard. How? Yeah, my wife is Japanese. Right. And she only takes transit. And 
I was afraid when she was taking transit during COVID. Yeah, yeah and we'll, we'll move away from this a little bit, but I just want to say nobody should ever feel afraid. So um, stand with you on that 100%. And, and I really appreciate the fact that you have brought this up because it's a, it's a tough conversation to have, right? Yeah, and so. there's been some good things come out of it, though, the, the dumpling festival that right. happened in Kokrimo. Right. Those, that was another example of a kind of an anti-racism incident that happened in Town Center Park. That's right. And then Something the ladies positive. decided to start the dumpling festival which is amazing it was which amazing great. festival yeah, yeah it was unbelievable it was yeah. awesome and yeah. then i saw you this weekend at a, a um truth and a reconciliation kind of event called weaving our stories towards reconciliation so uh, you know another way that the community is coming together to have these conversations and, and yeah tell these this stories. is a this is a very important topic for me yeah we have to i've um, last year, I visited uh, the Kamloops Residential School, which right. was yeah, also no, that's, hard. That's a really <laughs> really really yeah. No, I um, I really hard appreciate place to visit, but it's yeah. I think all Canadians have to go there and see yeah. that this is what happened. And I can see to, how heartfelt we have to yes. accept that that is the truth of Canada. Right? We have to acknowledge it that it happened, and then. Yeah hopefully work towards yeah. reconciliation. But um, I'm going to want to talk about respectful workplace. And thank you for having that conversation. Um, okay. Your, I don't know if we call it a slogan, or the words that you're running under are integrity, compassion, mm -hmm. and commitment. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about how those apply to respectful workplace, because we know that people come with lots of passion and lots of different ideas um, and they all sit around the council table how how can you see um, a way to work respectfully together do you think it's is there a way that everyone can work together oh yeah well there's i think there's seven i might talk a long time about this but there's there's seven points i like to bring up one is um define the culture of your your organization. Okay. You have to define what is right, what is wrong, and everyone has to follow those Agree, those rules or those accept. regulations in okay. in the workplace or wherever, right? Lead by example. Yeah. So show the people what they should do by doing that yourself. Right. And then people will follow your your example okay and number three is this too long <laughs> no you've got about two minutes so. oh, okay okay practice diversity and inclusivity in your hiring practices okay so we need all um, workplaces and in politics we need diversity and inclusivity in all those places and ask civility questions in your hiring process. So to, when you ask someone like, for example, um, can you give an example of how every voice in the room was given a chance to speak? Oh, okay. And provide training about, about having a respectful workplace. Right. So everyone knows what's, what's good and what's, what's bad and then provide some bonding experiences so people can get closer together. That's actually a and, really yeah. important point. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 So if everyone's bonded together, that means that they feel a part of the team, right? And you're committed to yeah. each other, yeah. right? Yeah. And lastly, check in regularly. Okay. Make sure that the managers or the leaders Talk to the employees. How are you doing? Maybe ask them about their situation. Are they having any problems? How are your tasks going at work? Things like that. Right. 
That's it. <laughs> Phil, I would like to say thank you so much for joining us. Um, you're obviously very passionate about what you're what you're doing here. Um, we've had some really good conversations and got to learn a little bit more about what your campaign is all about. And I'd like to wish you all the very best. Um, and I hope that we can talk again soon. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity. And it was really great talking to you. <laughs> uh, thank you. So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon on We've Got Issues. We've been talking to Phil Bucken, who is running for Coquitlam City Council. <music>